Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ed Steinfeld. I'm the director of the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all, and it's especially my pleasure to welcome back to Brown, Jim Young Kim. Thank you. <laughs> this event has many um, purposes. One purpose is uh, to serve as the first of a series of distinguished speakers to inaugurate our new building, Stephen Robert Hall, and celebrate this new physical space. Uh, physical space is important, but it's nowhere nearly as important as the human capital in our scholarly community. And that means all of you and students and uh, faculty who are here and staff, but it also means all of the loyal alums and friends who enrich our campus with their experience and knowledge. And who better to represent that piece of the scholarly community than Jim Kim? Uh, if it's OK with you, I, it, Jim Kim needs no introduction, but if it's OK, I'll provide a brief, a brief introduction. Uh, as you all know, Jim Kim just completed his tenure at uh, the World Bank as the bank's uh, 12th president. Uh, but if we turn the clock back a little bit, uh, Jim was born in Seoul, South Korea. And at the age of five, um, participated in a phenomena, an institution that um, many of you all participated in, or your parents or grandparents. And even if you didn't, we're all beneficiaries of this. And that's the, the institution of immigration to the US and a path to citizenship. <clears throat> Jim, at a young age, distinguished himself at Muscatine High School in Iowa as the valedictorian, not surprisingly, maybe a little more surprisingly, as quarterback of the football team and uh, <laughs> point guard of the basketball team. I think you also were playing golf at a very uh, high level already at that point. Uh, Jim continued to distinguish himself at Brown, graduating in 1982. Uh, soon after that, a little bit later in the 1980s, he co-founded Partners in Health uh, with, um, I guess, your MD, PhD classmate. Paul Farmer. You, we were a couple years apart. Yeah. Yeah. Close, cl uh, nearly classmate. Um, and as you all know, Partners in Health is a, an organization originally focused on Haiti, but worldwide focused on community based health care and infectious disease control. Um, on the basis of that experience and having earned his MD and PhD, Jim uh, moved on to be the director of the World Health Organization's HIV AIDS department. And then after his tenure there, returned to Harvard as professor of medicine, social medicine, and human rights, and chair of the Department of Global Health and Medicine. Following that phase of his career, uh, Jim became the 17th president of Dartmouth College, and uh, onward to the, the bank. Um, but this is by no means your most important title, but we're adding to the list Watson Senior Fellow, and we welcome you to the Watson community, and welcome you, as I said, back to the Brown community. As many of you know, uh, Jim, since 2017, has been serving as a, as a trustee on the Brown Corporation. Thank you for continually, continuously giving. Uh, I thought what we would do is I, I will just ask Jim a few questions. We'll begin a, a, a casual conversation. But after that brief period, really what the purpose is uh, of, this, of this gathering is to open it up to you all. So please get your questions ready. And uh, after just a few minutes, we'll turn to you. So Jim, let me just start um, by asking you, as a few days ago, you, you were um, president of the bank. What do you feel your legacy for? Well, you know, it is a bank. And so um, when, I, um, when I arrived, in 2012, uh, we'd finished that fiscal year, and we'd done about $35 billion worth of business. And uh, that, that sounds like a lot, uh, but it's actually pretty small compared to the needs in developing countries. And so uh, over the six and a half year period, uh, we were able to increase our fund called IDA for the poorest countries. Uh, we, it, when I, when I uh, joined, it was about 42, 43 billion over three years. Uh, uh, and uh, the latest replenishment was $75 billion. So we really increased the amount of money going to, to, uh, to the poorest countries. But I think the, 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 biggest, um, uh, the biggest thing that happened was that we, uh, we received more capital. And so banks need capital in order to be able to go to the capital markets and, and borrow on behalf of clients. And uh, at a time when um, just about everyone predicted that we, there was no way we were going to get an increase in our capital, we did. And that was last April. So, um, uh, you know, having started at about $35 billion in 2012, in a couple of years, we'll be at a steady state of about $100 billion a year. So the increasing the capital was, was the thing that I think, um, how should I put it? it it's, the, it's the thing that won't go away, and it's the thing that 
uh, is going to put the World Bank Group on a very different footing in terms of its ability to respond to the, the various crises in the world. And so among the things that changed during the time that I was there, the first was we became much more involved in climate change-related activities. We are now by far the largest um, uh, 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 provider, and I say we still, I should say they, but uh, the World Bank Group became the largest funder of climate change-related activities in developing countries by far. And um, uh, it was just a couple, you know, maybe a month ago uh, that, um, uh, that the, bank, the bank announced that there would be $200 billion uh, for uh, climate change over the next five years, which is just an enormous increase in the amount of um, funding available. So um, that, but also, uh, you know, we, uh, uh, we became involved in refugee issues. And we became involved in refugee issues not because we are a, a refugee-focused organization. We're not. There's the High Commissioner for Refugees. There are all the different relief organizations. But it became clear that um, in countries where there are refugees, uh, there, the, the issues are not short term, that there were some refugee camps that had been operating for 30 or 40 years. And so, it, in fact, it was Antonio Guterres, the current Secretary General of the United Nations, who really uh, encouraged the World Bank Group to get involved. Because he's saying, you know, we're mostly lawyers trying to deal with legal issues of refugees, but what they really need is uh, development um, support, because th these things are going on for su such a long time. Um, we got involved in pandemics, and uh, you know, it, it was. It was just a, almost a, you know, a freak accident that I happened to be an infectious disease doctor watching the Ebola outbreak just explode in Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea. And I called, you mentioned I, you know, my, my, uh, my friend Paul Farmer. I called Paul. I said, Paul, what is going on? Because it had been going on for eight months, and he was actually in the field, and he said, you know, I have never seen this much virus in a community before. I don't. I don't know if we can stop it. I don't know if we can stop it from going to every corner of the earth. And so I, I dug into it. I said, so what's going on here? Why, why isn't anyone responding? And, it, and there was no good answer. It was just sort of, well, you know, maybe it'll, it'll slow down. Maybe someone else will do something. And so we stepped up and um, uh, made a pledge of $400 million. And we were the first organization at that time uh, to make that kind of a pledge. And then soon after, the United States and, and the UK came along. But the question I kept asking was, well, why do we have to wait until some country decides to be generous before responding to pandemics? There should be something like an automatic mechanism. So we actually created pandemic insurance. And it still exists. And what, what we, we got all the infectious disease doctors, the modelers together, with the reinsurance company, Swiss Re and Munich specifically, and we came up with an insurance policy. We went to the capital markets, didn't know if anyone would be interested, uh, but we now have $450 million that will automatically be released whenever an epidemic reaches a certain uh, stage. And so we'll never have to sit around and wait again. So you know, the, 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 these things that people call global public goods, you know, responding to things like climate change and pandemics and refugees, uh, were really a new area uh, uh, for the bank in many ways. And um, the great David Weil is here, uh, the, the professor. Well, I came to see him um, about a year ago, right? something like that. And we, uh, the, the thing that uh, was really bothering me um, in, in health and education, I've been, I've been working on health and ed education my entire life. And I think that you know, after spending a lifetime arguing for more funding from rich countries for health and education, wh what I learned um, as president of the World Bank was that many countries, that in many countries, the heads of state and ministers of finance were hiding behind that. They were saying, oh, we are so committed to health and education, and if the rich countries just gave us more money, we would invest in it. But then when we actually looked at how much they were investing, they were basically spending none of their own money. And some of the countries that were spending none of their own money were oil-producing countries. They were spending on militaries. They were spending on things that made no sense. And so um, uh, with David, we said, well, can we come up with a ranking system. Can we connect health and education outcomes directly to economic growth, which is David's area? And we found that we actually could make very good correlations. And then we could actually rank countries in terms of the quality of their investments in human beings. And the reason we did that was because I noticed we, we, don't, we only do one major ranking a year um, at the bank. And, and this was something called uh, the Doing Business Report. And the Doing Business Report, every year, that was my busiest time of the year because countries hate it when you rank them. 
right? Because the natural question is, hey, why are we ranked below this country that we've always felt superior to, right? And so they always paid attention to it. So I thought, let's do a ranking on human capital. And so we did it. Um, I had to warn the countries a year in advance that I was going to do it. And by the time that they got a sense of where they would come out in the ranking, it was too late because we'd already gone so far. And we released the ranking and the response, and I haven't even had a chance to talk to David about it, it was completely different from what I expected. I expected there to be anger, where there's no way you should rank us this low. That wasn't it. The, the ministers of finance started saying, wow, we didn't realize. I mean, they, were, they really said, we didn't realize that we could be foregoing 50% of our potential economic growth by not investing more in, in people. And what they also said was, hey, maybe um, <clears throat> this, is, this is something that I can use to hold my ministers of health and education accountable. You guys just looked at outcomes. You didn't look at, at investment. Because it, it, you know, it would have been easy if we, if we looked at <clears throat> amount of money spent, they could have just made a big you know, budgetary change and, 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 and go up the rankings. We looked at outcomes in you know, childhood stunting, uh, educational outcomes. We now are able to, um, uh, to, 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 uh, to judge uh, how much value is a, does, does a single year of education provide in Malawi versus Singapore? You know, unfortunately, it's, about, it's less than half uh, of the value. So we had something called learning adjusted years of schooling. That plus childhood stunting plus, um, plus under five mortality uh, plus adult mortality. Those, just those four measures uh, were extremely powerful uh, uh, explainers, if you will, of economic growth looking backwards. And we could say that going forward, if you don't focus on improving these outcomes, you are foregoing uh, economic growth. And it, it, seemed to, it seemed to really make a difference. People, you know, at, at the, the uh, you know, Nigeria was ranked 152 out of 157 countries that we ranked, 152. And I expected them to be very upset about it. But in, instead, the vice president, when, when they got the ranking, called the meeting of all the ministers and said, okay, this is a wake-up call for us. We have to invest more. We have to get better outcomes. We have to change the way we approach uh, uh, this investment in people. So I, those, are, those are the big things. Um, uh, but I, you know, I think the, uh, the, the, the issue that um, made me feel comfortable um, uh, resigning from the World Bank Group was the fact that financially, the bank was so much better off than it was um, uh, when, I, when I came on board. Thanks. If I can ask, though, why at this particular moment did you choose to step down? I mean, the, the global situation isn't necessarily um, particularly um, um, positive toward multilateral lending organizations. And um, there are a number of reasons why I think organizations like the World Bank feel to be under threat. Then. So why, why this, this particular juncture? But so uh, while that's the story that people tell, that multilateralism is under threat, uh, the, the, um, uh, the governors, 189 governors, voted in April to provide the largest capital increase in the history of the institution. And it's already, the, the, at least a, a big chunk of it has already been approved by legislatures. And so, um, yeah, in some ways you could say it's ne there's never a good time to leave an organization. Uh, but... Um, uh, Despite all the questions of multilateralism, on the other hand, you know, the governors voted to give a, a capital increase and linked it to a very robust plan for what the World Bank would do going forward. So in a sense, it was actually written, you know, not in stone, but it was, it was written down what the future was going to look like. And it was going to be a pretty bright future for the World Bank group. The reason I stepped down now is because I, I've been saying this now for almost every day, literally for the last three years, that um, uh, if you put all the money coming through foreign assistance, if you put, then add to it all the money that comes from multilateral development banks, it doesn't begin to touch the need <clears throat> in developing countries. And needs for things like, um, uh, you know, the, the every, every uh, almost every day, <clears throat> I read something new about climate change that really worries me. Uh, uh, things that are moving much more quickly than we ever thought. Uh, and, and the thing is, it's not just um, moving toward renewable energy. It's that the developing countries are being devastated by the changes in climate. I mean, there's not a single African leader who can't tell you um, story after story after story of how climate change is affecting the, you know, uh, their, their lives. I mean, the Syrian crisis 
uh, followed three years of drought in a row. So there's, you know, what, what the African leader said to me all the time is, well, you guys talk about climate change, but you know the boot of climate change is on our necks every day. Droughts and floods and droughts and floods, roads that can't handle uh, the torrential rains. It's just, it, it's story after story after story, so that's one. The other <clears throat> thing that I think concerns me uh, as much as climate change is, uh, is in, on the one hand, great. Uh, you know, by 2025, between 2025 and 2030, Everyone in the world will have access to broadband. Uh, and this is, you know, you know, maybe it's sooner than that, maybe it's later than that, but it's around that scale. And uh, we, we now know what happens when people get access to the internet. The first response is they're happy, because they're seeing more in the world, they're communicating with other people, there's a happiness to it. But then we also know that aspirations actually go up. And, and uh, the great thing is that the, the World Bank Group, uh, uh, we can actually measure how much aspirations go up. And it turns out that if your reference income, the income to which you compare your own, right, if your reference income uh, goes up 20%, so that you don't, you're not comparing yourself to your neighbors anymore, you're comparing yourself to people in the next country or even in the next continent, uh, if that goes up 20%, your own income has to go up 10% in order to feel the same level of satisfaction. But if you're a poor person, if you're in the lower uh, um, uh, uh, quintiles of, uh, of the population, if the reference income goes to 20%, your income has to go up even more than that. Right? And so th there's something that happens when people can see how everyone else lives, their aspirations are going up. And you know, again, if you ask any leader of a developing country, they'll say, oh my goodness, absolutely, that's happening. Everyone's aspirations are going up. And so if everyone's aspirations are going up, but some of the fundamental assumptions about economic development are now in question. I mean, the uh, fundamental assumptions were, well, you know, countries go, will, will start with agriculture, but then they'll move to light manufacturing, you know, you know, garments and shoes, because garments and shoes will always require human hands. And then ultimately, they'll move to heavy industry. And I tell you, every single African head of state wants to talk to me about their path toward industrialization. And I have to tell you, there's not much evidence that that's going to happen in just about any country in Africa. Even the most developed countries in Africa seem to be deindustrializing rather than industrializing. And there's good reason for that. I mean, you know, they, uh, in Bangladesh, there was this amazing story about how Bangladeshi uh, garment factories were purchasing robots from Germany to make garments. So the number of new jobs in the garment industry, even in Bangladesh, which is the most efficient garment industry in the world, were going down year after year. And so if, uh, if uh, even garments and shoes are being taken over by robots, what are people going to do? And so uh, that, that question is, uh, is a critically important one. And my conclusion uh, was, unless there's much more investment coming in from the private sector, unless we, you know, there's so much capital out there um, sitting idle. In other words, you know, negative interest rate bonds, these are for the non-finance uh, people, these are bonds in which you give your money to a bank, and not only do they not pay you interest, you pay them every year to hold your money. And there's about $8 trillion in negative interest rate bonds, about $20 trillion in very low-yielding government bonds, and another uh, $8 to $10 trillion in cash. I mean, people literally with 1,000 euro bills sitting in their safes. So there's all this money sitting on the sideline. There's all this opportunity uh, to get a much better return than that in developing countries, and very little of that investment actually happening. And so I've been saying this for three years. We, if, we don't, if we don't get the private sector investing much more uh, aggressively and in and, and much greater volume in developing countries, there's no hope to tackle things like climate change uh, or the rising aspiration of people. And so um, I just, out of the blue, I had this opportunity, the, 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 the really um, the, the, one of the, if not the most successful infrastructure investment uh, uh, company in the world, who, that, that, who's, that's run by a Nigerian man, a man who was born in, and went to, through high school in Nigeria um, uh, and had invested mostly in developed economies, in the so-called OECD economies, had just decided that he's going to make a major move into developing countries. And he was a friend of mine, and he, you know, uh, we, we, we met, we talked. He said, look, if you're, I hear you've been saying this, and uh, if you're serious about it, we're going to start doing this right now. And so for me, it was a sense of urgency to get that project going. That's the thing, you know, we were having meeting after meeting after meeting on impact investing 
Um, every, you know, so many people were saying, well, we're really committed to environment, social governance, the so-called ESG concerns, we're gonna bring it into our investing, but very little of it happening. So um, I, I just, I thought to myself, look, we've grown the size of the World Bank. There's long, broad agreement on, on, uh, on where we're, the bank is supposed to go. And in my mind, the most urgent task was to start mobilizing this capital and moving it to developing countries. And so that's what I'm gonna do. Makes sense. Uh, along a similar, in a similar vein, uh, there's of course private capital to be mobilized <laughs> and there's a lot of sovereign yeah. as well. And my understanding is that when you served as president of the bank, you were open to thinking about working with China's Belt and Road Initiative and also doing projects with the uh, Asian investment. Um, can you tell me more about how do you see big players like that uh, moving forward in, in development and how do you see these funds generally? Are they, what are the terms that, are, that they're operating on? What extent do they fit geopolitical ambitions? What should we make? So we'll take tackle Belt and Road, but let's, let's, let's um, start with, uh, with Norway. Right? So Norway, small country, about 5 million people, but incredibly generous in terms of their uh, contribution to, uh, to aid. Right? They give, uh, uh, maybe Sweden is highest per capita, but Sweden, between, between Sweden and Norway, who, you know, the highest amount of aid given per capita. Uh, they also have a $1 trillion or so sovereign wealth fund. And of course, Norway is an oil exporting country. And, uh, at the same time, they've made huge commitments to tackling climate change. So lots of complicated ideas, but, but it's an amazing place with wonderful uh, people. And, uh, and you know, uh, there's a conservative government now in Norway, but Erna Solberg is, has done so much you know, around social issues. It's uh, conservative. It, it would be a little different perspective from the U.S., you know, uh, what, what conservative might mean. But uh, Prime Minister Solberg, uh, you know, made lots of commitments about how much of that sovereign wealth fund will be uh, invested in, say, climate change related activities. And, and what happens is that at the political level, they come to meetings that I host and they make all kinds of very strong um, commitments and promises. But then when it gets down to the level of the investment committee of the sovereign wealth fund, they ask all the same questions that they would ask of any. Uh, investment. What's your return? What's the risk? Uh, can you explain to me the nature of the risk that I'm taking to get this return? Gee, if I can get 15% in OECD countries, why would I take the risk of investing in emerging markets and you're only going to offer me 15% return, right? You need to offer me double that return for me to take the risk. And so it gets stopped at some level. Right? And so, uh, you know, there, there's, there's just, there's so much of that capital. And the fact that they end up putting so much of it in very low yielding bonds, because they just don't want to take the risk of investing in emerging markets, is why uh, this is going so slowly. Right? And so uh, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, is, is um, you know, one of the most ambitious initiatives ever announced. I mean, the, 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 uh, what, what, they are, what, what they want to do in terms of building connectivity and infrastructure across the developing world, including Africa, was just enormously ambitious. And when I was at the World Bank Group, I believe that um, any country uh, that, 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 um, uh, that professes to want to make those kinds of contributions, because there are member countries, we have to engage them. We have to, um, uh, we ha we have to uh, understand uh, what they're doing and that you know, when, they're, uh, when they're at the point of actually making those investments, we have to do whatever we can uh, to make sure that, that those investments work out as positively as possible for the poor countries who are receiving those investments. So I was, uh, you know, just like I was open to working with Norway on climate change and, and with the DFID, the British uh, uh, aid agency, I was very uh, open to and, and uh, um, uh, actively working with China because it's one of the major development initiatives. So. Uh, that, that was my position on it, and it really didn't change uh, during the time that, um, that I was at the Bank. Do you feel, with the Belt and Road Initiative, um, at least what we've seen so far, do you feel that those investments are serving the kinds of functions that you described, whether it's for preparation for climate change or preparation to, for, for countries to leapfrog in developmental terms? Um, is it working? 
in development? Well, you know, they're, um, uh, they're, they're, they're every development agency and every, um, uh, a, every uh, aid agency has a mixed record. Right? And so um, uh, w one of the things that, you, that, that, that is just important to acknowledge is that um, in Africa, for example, if you ask the question, what entities are putting real risk capital into building infrastructure in Africa? There aren't that many entities that are doing it, and China happens to be doing it. Now, you know, uh, issues of debt transparency ha have come up. You know, we want to we want to know, uh, you know, wh where, you, you, how much is uh, are these countries indebted? Are they being transparent about their debt? You know, what, what what's going on here? And those are questions that I think you know China is ready to to, to tackle, and 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 they realize that they have to tackle it. But I think one of the things we have to do is step back and say. You know, the needs in Africa are just enormous, right? And, you know, what are the entities that are ready to make real investments in the kind of infrastructure that will be critical for them to have any chance of competing in the global economy of the future? And unfortunately, there's just very little of it. Now, interestingly, Japan is also stepping up and making many new investments in, in Africa. There are all kinds of complicated, you know, reasons. Uh, and, and the, you know, the relationship between China and, and Japan, of course, is also complicated, but also, you know, also uh, there, there's a lot of economic activity going on between those two countries. But um, it, you know, uh, there's not been enough attention still uh, to investments in Africa. So eventually, and, and um, uh, one, of the, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the things that just have to happen is that we've got to find a way of bringing um, a real uh, a development assistance and probably in the form of, uh, of, of risk capital that will take on the risk of building infrastructure in Africa. And you know, again, China's, China has been by far the largest provider of that kind of capital. So. In, a, in a global environment in which there seems to be such a resurgence of identity politics, ethno-nationalism, siloed national economies, uh, lack of a desire, at least in the US, to invest in global institutions, global norms, in that kind of a context, how does private risk capital operate? Or what do you think the effects of private risk capital, or even some sovereign capital, moving in and playing this kind of developmental role? Can it work in, a, in the kind of environment we're living in? Today? Yeah. Um, well, let me put it this way. I, I, I have seen it work. I mean, I have, I, I have seen it work. And, um, it, you know, it, it, and, and if we don't find a way of making it work and making it work more effectively, we're really looking at a very bleak future for especially the low-income countries. I mean, you know, one of the things that just has to happen is that there, we've got to put in place the basic um, requirements for uh, countries to take advantage of the paths to economic development that will be open to them. Right? And so one of the uh, examples that I think are most encouraging are things that we again see in China, uh, e-commerce. And e-commerce, it's very, Specific. So, so I, I, I recently visited Guizhou, um, and, and, and you know, Guizhou is one of the poorest provinces. And it was, it, it, you know, they, they kept telling me, Jim, you keep visiting the rich provinces in China. We want to take you to a poor province. So I, I went to Guizhou. Right? I landed in Guizhou, and the airport's better than, you know, any of the airports I've seen for a long time. But they had a 30% poverty rate five years ago, and it dropped to 5%. And the drop from 30% to 5% was based on e-commerce. Right? Now, they, there were other things too. They, they found out that it was so poor that the air was really clean and the water was really clean, and they had caves that were perfect for server farm. So they were now one of the biggest server farm uh, hosts in, uh, in, in, in the world. Uh, but what happened was Alibaba and the Chinese government went in and both provided very specific subsidies. Alibaba provided subsidies to the transport companies uh, to encourage them to go deep into the countryside. Uh, the government provided warehouses and storage for, um, uh, for uh, uh, e-commerce entrepreneurs to be able to bring in, for example, you know, agricultural goods, store them, and then send them all over the world. So it also turned out that because Guizhou was so poor, the air and the earth, excuse me, the water and the earth were, were very clean, and therefore the kiwis were very high quality. So they started selling kiwis all over the world, right? uh, especially in Europe. And you started seeing young people come back from the coasts where they were working in factories 
that were, by the way, becoming roboticized. They came back from the factories and started e-commerce businesses. And one family, and we did a, we did a, um, a feature on them in the, on the World Bank Group website, they'd been making um, two to 3,000 uh, um, renminbi per month. And they went from that income to 30,000 renminbi per month, employed their whole family, and they were kiwi exporters. And all they did, their part of the value chain was collecting the kiwis from the, the farmers, packaging them, and then sending them. Uh, and so, you know, it, to, to be able to decrease poverty that quickly over five years, it immediately made me think, wow, I didn't know that you could, um, uh, you could lift people out of poverty this quickly with agriculture. And so it made me think, is this possible for Africa? And so if, if we're going to make it possible for Africa, what do you need? You need energy, you need ports, you need transport, you need roads, you need transport companies, which, by the way, Alibaba helped create because when they, when they exploded, they knew that the Chinese Postal Service would never be able to handle the volume of packages that they were sending. So they actually created transport companies like the DHLs and the, and the FedEx companies, um, and uh, uh, you know, electricity, of course, and broadband. So electricity, broadband, transport, if you have those three, uh, you have a chance of participating in the, in the global economy. And I, you know, I, I met Jack Ma from Alibaba very early in my tenure and have been working very closely with him, and I've been pushing him to go to Africa. And so he's now starting, and he's working in Rwanda to try to see if he can build an e-commerce platform in Rwanda, if, if, if he can do that, then I think it, the, it's the duty of the world to build the infrastructure as quickly as possible so that countries in Africa can participate in that kind of e-commerce. So, so uh, in, words, in other words, you know, in other words, what, what I'm saying is, you know, um, uh, how is that infrastructure gonna be built? Right? It is not gonna be built with aid. There's not anywhere near enough aid in the world. But for things like energy and, and ports, and um, uh, broadband, those things can be done on a commercial basis. In other words, there's enough revenue so that people will be attracted and bring capital because there's revenue. And in, in that case, if you can make it work and, the, and they, they can participate in e-commerce, then they have a chance of actually starting businesses, you know, participating in the global economy, having enough tax uh, revenue then to pay for health and education and start that positive cycle. We know that cycle has to start. There's just no way that and any of these countries are gonna survive purely on the basis of aid. You've got to get that going. And uh, in order to get that going, you've got to build that basic infrastructure. I know it's not your responsibility to answer the, the question I'm about to ask, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway. What does one say to people in the global north who respond, those developments are taking our jobs or, 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 or undermining our own well-being, or we don't believe in this developmental mission because it's detracting from us. And whether that's voiced in kind of ethno-nationalistic terms, or whether it's voiced by people who are truly experiencing what we'd associate with developing world problems, but they're in the global north, how does one deal with that kind of political backlash to these successes that you're describing? Yeah, you know, I, I don't, I, I really don't believe that it's a zero-sum game. Um, and, and so if you were, I, I mean, I, I was never, as World Bank Group president, I was never asked to comment um, on, you know, the nature of the preparedness of the American workforce for the economy of the future. But if I were asked, I would say, look, there is not a single country on earth that can take for granted that they're prepared for the economy of the future. And, the, and every single country in the world should be worried about whether or not it's preparing its own human capital to tackle the challenges of the future. And so, uh, it, you know, this matters uh, a lot to everywhere, including in the United States. And so, um, uh, you know, are there countries where they're taking a very uh, strategic approach to preparing their human capital for the economy of the future? And the answer is, yeah, a lot of them in Asia. Right? And, and uh, you know, if you look at the test scores and you look at the number of engineers that are being graduated and, and you look across the different um, uh, countries uh, uh, in Asia, Africa, Latin America, why, you know, there are countries that are, <clears throat> are getting more prepared and there are countries that are getting less prepared. So <clears throat> it's a challenge for everybody. And so I, I feel like that, that my role, you know, at, at the World Bank was to try to think about all the, <clears throat> the countries that were our client countries. I wasn't really engaged in looking at OECD countries. And now, um, uh, you know, it's still, I'm going to be focused almost completely on uh, on developing countries. 
but you know, uh, the the country, I mean, excuse me, the company and Global Infrastructure Partners has done a lot of infrastructure in developed countries that has also been critical uh, for, uh, for providing the foundations for economic growth. Is there a need for better infrastructure in OECD countries? Absolutely, absolutely, there's, there, there's a need for it. And there's also, I mean, no country score, had a perfect score on the Human Capital Index. Singapore was number one, but it's small, six million people. Um, Korea and Japan were tied for number two. And, you know, they, even some of the European countries didn't do as well as they thought they'd do. Right. Um, maybe I'll just ask one last question because we want to open it up. But if, if you were starting all over again, or if you're in the position of many of the students in the room, and you were interested in development, how would you get involved? Is the answer, to, I know there are many answers, but would you still encourage people to migrate toward multilateral lending organizations? Is it the private sector? What's really the way to get in now? Well, I think, I think what's really important is to, especially for Brown students, is to find something here that just really gets you excited. Right? And, it, and it's, it almost doesn't matter what it is. Um, uh, you know, a lot of people think, well, I have to study a STEM, uh, discipline I have to study, you know, whatever, um, uh, I have to have a skill. But, uh, you know, every single job I've ever had, in every single organization I've ever had, in, or I've ever been in, uh, has needed people who are better thinkers and writers. Right? I, I mean, I've never been in a place where we'd say, oh, we got too many good writers. Never. It's always, we don't have enough people who can write a great sentence, who can do a great thoughtful analysis of um, of a, you know, of a complex social or political problem, right? And so it almost doesn't matter what you do. And then um, once you leave here, uh, I, I think it's, it's important to get some experiences with just great institutions. And, it, and again, I think it doesn't matter what they are. It can be a financial institution, it can be a startup, it can be um, a university, you know, whatever it is, expose yourself to things that are constantly challenging. I mean, I, I guess, you know, my, my whole career, if you, could, if you wanted to characterize it in briefly, it would be, I said yes to things that nobody thought I could actually do, right? And, and, um, and, and in, in taking on these seemingly impossible projects, um, it was very intense during the time of taking them on, uh, but um, you kind of, you feel like you're drowning for a while, but then you sort of get your nose above water, and then when you get your head above water, Right? Um, you, you actually then understand how much you've learned. Right? So, I, you know, when you're, when, you're, when you're coming out of Brown, I just think there's hardly anything that you can't tackle. And so um, expose yourself to great people, great thinkers, great institutions, difficult problems. And then over time, who knows how institutions will develop? I mean, they, uh, you know, the World Bank today is different from the World Bank that I inherited, which was different from the World Bank that Bob Zellick inherited. Things in institutions change all the time. I, if you destroy multilateral institutions, you'll have to quickly build them up again because they, they play absolutely critical roles. I mean, if nothing else, they're places where people can um, talk to each other. I mean, the convening power of uh, even the most inefficient uh, multilateral organization is so important that, that if, if they didn't exist, you'd have to, you'd have to invent them. And, or another way to say it is somebody's going to be rebuilding those institutions. Somebody will be. Somebody will be. And, and, and they, they, they will build them in places, you know, other than here. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we want to open it up. I'd like to open it up now. Uh, for those of you who have questions, please make your way to, please go to the microphone so that uh, everybody can hear you. You're welcome to line up behind the microphones if you don't mind. We'll just start. Yeah, Jazz. And if you could please just briefly introduce yourself. Hi, uh, Jazz Alawalia, Med School of Public Health. So uh, a little bit of a quirky question, just because we have a mutual friend, Mark Rosenberg, says hi. Um, so uh, you talked about, you know, to students, affiliate yourself with great institutions, so on and so forth. Tell us a little bit about, because Mark was telling me that sort of you, him, Paul Farmer, and I think Howard Hyatt and a few others sort of, you know, collected together early in your life, because it was after Brown and then your MD-PhD program, you obviously connected with sort of great thinkers and people who ended up doing really cool things. Say a little bit about the role of peers at that oh, early yeah. stage in your life. So, you know, Mark, uh, just to give you a little back, Mark is the one who made violence a public health issue, right? And, and in the process of, I mean, he, he, he started saying that 
uh, that gun-related violence is a public health issue, right? And he was so hated by certain factions of people that he lost his job, right? And so Mark's been an extremely close friend. We worked together on a huge project. And uh, he was a visionary and he was courageous. He took on really difficult uh, um, uh, opponents. And I still am in close touch with him today. So Paul Farmer, I'm in touch with him all the time. We're going to continue to work together. I'm going back on the board of Partners in Health. And so people like Howard Hyatt, Paul Farmer, Mark Rosenberg, these people, and Ophelia Dahl, and th these are people who I've worked with for 30 years. And, and for us, uh, you know, and, and a lot of people look at my career and say, well, what's the unifying theme? Well, the unifying theme is that I've, I've said yes to things that I thought would help us in the original theme, which was to make a preferential option for the poor. If you haven't seen it, it's going to be available on, on, I think, Google soon enough. There was a movie made about the work we did uh, and on HIV, TB, uh, uh, and about Partners in Health, and it's called Bending the Arc. We, we were supposed to do a showing at some point, and we will, and we, we'll do it at some point. And, the, you know, all of the basics are there, right? You know, the, 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 the reality of poverty in the world uh, is something that we committed to each other, we'd tackle forever. Right? And so um, uh, having, having uh, colleagues where pretty early on you say, okay, these are, these are our most fundamental commitments. The, the notion of uh, making a preferential option for the poor, which is language that comes from uh, Latin American liberation theology, um, uh, but it's not, you know, for us, it is not at all religious, but it, it's something that all of the partners in health world has embraced. And I feel like in many ways, I've been sent from Partners in Health to various other places uh, to try to push that along. And so, uh, you know, I, I talked at great length to, uh, to my Partners in Health colleagues about this decision I'm making. And I, I actually, I, I mean, I really believe that after doing the things that we've accomplished at, uh, at, at the World Bank Group, that the most important next step is for me to actually build this infrastructure. Right? And, uh, you know, not surprisingly, I'm sure I'll be working with Rwanda again. I'll be, you know, I, it'd be great if we could build infrastructure in Haiti. I mean, that's a Haiti's such a wonderful but difficult place. Uh, so, uh, if you can find a group of people who you have a meeting of the minds with at this most fundamental level, what what is the most important reality, reality, most important commitment you make? Then I think it helps you as you go through different institutions. I never really stopped being a partners in health person at the World Health Organization, at Harvard, at any of these organizations, including Dartmouth and the World Bank. Yeah. Hi, I'm Wendy. I'm also from Seoul, South Korea, and I'm a junior studying political science. Um, I just have a question regarding the agenda setting or decision makings of the World Bank. So I am aware that the World Bank currently runs under a weighted voting system, and the US is definitely one of its greatest contributors and the only country that actually has a veto power to veto decisions made in the World Bank. Um, so just in terms of when you're deciding which development projects or which lending projects the World Bank is going to proceed, I was wondering how big is the influence of the U.S. in these decision-making processes? Because I also feel like local voices or local opinions are pretty crucial when you're trying to proceed into a project. Like, for instance, um, I think you mentioned something about developing an e-commerce in Rwanda. Like, the Rwandan government might not necessarily want to prioritize that issue just because, in general, most of the input that comes in development issues, personally for me, I feel like comes from the global north. And some of these concepts or like these ideology might not necessarily be something familiar to the, to the developing nations. So I was just wondering about the dynamics and decision making and um, how much progress in terms of SDGs this dynamic has made throughout your term as serving as the president of the World Bank. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the, the bank is different from, um, from uh, say, the Uni United Nations. The United Nations will, will tell you that it's, it's one country, one vote. But there's also a Security Council, and there's a permanent members of the Security Council. So it's not actually, you know, the, the, every vote is not weighted equally. The bank is just pretty straightforward about it, and the weight of any institution is based on the weight of a country in the global economy. So China's share has grown, for example, um, uh, uh, and also uh, based on contributions to the World Bank. So the U.S. has about a, in, in, and, and there are different pieces of it. The U.S. has a higher percentage share in, uh, in IFC, the private sector group. Um, in, in the World Bank, um, it has about a 15% share. But it doesn't use that on every vote. 
So um, the, the veto power only comes with things like changing the Constitution or changing the Articles of Agreement of the bank. Um, generally speaking, uh, the board tries to make decisions on a consensus basis. Right? But on something like what happens in Rwanda, that has completely changed. You know, I was a protester against the World Bank 25 years ago, and, and a lot of it was because of criticisms about the World Bank dictating policy. And now, there's, you know, th th there's no way that we would start a project anywhere um, when I was there uh, without the, the country actually agreeing to it. Right? And, and countries would come to the World Bank and say, well, I want a road going back to my hometown. And we'd say no. Right? We, we, we can't do that. We can't get that through our board because it's so, you know, it, 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 it just feels you know, like it's um, just for the benefit of the leader. Right? Uh, so we'd have to make sure that it was um, sound based on, uh, uh, on development principles. But if the country leader says no, it doesn't happen. But there's no way that we could force uh, you know, e-commerce. And by the way, President Kagame is just crazy about the e-commerce idea, right? Uh, you know, see, think about it. He's got a garment factory. Uh, he's got a garment factory industry, uh, but um, he's running at about 60% of the efficiency of Bangladesh. And the only reason that the garment factory stays in business is because of the African Growth and Opportunity Act in the United States. There's, there, there is um, a preferential admission to the American market because it's country in Africa, and right now there are investors willing to, to, to invest in those companies. But let's say something happens and the United States decides that Rwanda no longer is covered under the African Growth and Opportunity Act. That industry would collapse overnight, literally overnight, right? So, you know, he knows that, and so he, he has to think, okay, is there something we can do? Can we sell, you know, Rwandan coffee, which is now sold in a lot of places, can we sell that directly? for higher profit for the coffee growers. There's all kinds of possibilities, and with e-commerce, it could happen. So it's not that the North dictating to the South. Now, the Sustainable Development Goals, right? So it's like everything on Earth. It, it, it's huge. There are so many goals. And at first, I thought, oh, you know, the great thing about the Millennium Development Goals was that they were really focused. But then over time, I began, became, I, uh, you know, I, I came to realize this is, the, the sustainable development goals actually do reflect aspirations of people. And, 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 and so, no, no, you know, they're huge and they're broad and there are things in it that you can't even imagine what it really means, you know, access to information. I mean, just there's, there are things that are not so clearly defined, uh, but I think it does reflect what everyone's, people are going to want to have a middle-class life everywhere in the world, right? And I tell this story about my parents because my parents, uh, we were very lucky in the, in the, in the early 1950s, uh, because of the kindness of, uh, of strangers, literally, they came to the United States, and they actually met and married in the United States. And so what happened to them is that by coming to the United States, their aspirations were lifted. And when they went back to Korea, they thought, oh, you know, we're not going to be able to provide uh, the things that the United States can provide to our kids, so we're going we're gonna to move to the United States. Now, very few Koreans in the 1950s had those raised aspirations because very few Koreans had the experience of living in the United States. Now everyone on earth is gonna be able to have the experience that my parents had directly. And they're gonna be able to see it right on their smartphones. And so um, because of that, the sustainable development goals are actually, that, that's what we've gotta to get to. And so um, we're involved in, in uh, a huge number of the, of the SDGs and all of the ones related to climate, for example, we're by far the largest financer of, of all of those. Um, even on refugees, where we didn't work before, we're, we're, we're involved in financing those. And so, you know, I think one of the, one of the really important things that, that, that happened uh, during my tenure was that you just, it, there happened to be two Koreans, you know, one uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon at the UN and me at the World Bank Group. And um, he's older than me, so, you know, it was very, a very easy relationship, you know, in Korea. He was Sun Ben, I was Hubei, you know, he was the older one, I was the younger one. And so he was the leader and I followed him. Um, usually I followed him with money and, and uh, he, li he, he, he liked that, right? Uh, and, and, and we would do things together where, where he would work on the political aspects of it. We would agree on, you know, some kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, major development project that we would work on together. And, and then we would move forward together. So, you know, uh, Secretary General Bunn is the one who made the SDGs happen. And, you know, the other really just, you know, kind of wildly um, uh, 
uh, you know, fortunate outcome was the fact that Antonio Guterres was the was you know the the man who brought the World Bank and the UN together when he was a High Commissioner for Refugees, and so we're it, you know we were just completely involved in the SDGs, and um, the criticisms before that are too broad. I don't think they're valid anymore. I, I you know unfortunately that's the task. You, you know if we don't get there, if we don't get there by 2030, I think we're looking at a situation where climate change is going to have devastating effects. And I think we're also looking at a situation where there's going to be a lot of unrest because people are going to expect more. They're going to want more without opportunity. And do, do you think that coincidence of like-minded leaders, can it happen now in, you know, in this current context, a particular administration in the U.S., but, but mirrored to some extent in other parts of the world, with the appointment of a new World Bank <coughs> president at this moment, can that coincidence that you just described happen? Well, I hope so. I mean, you know, uh, um, the, the, um, the, the process, I mean, the, you know, when I, when I was a, a candidate, I had to run against, you know, two other candidates. Uh, we'll see what happens this time. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, as I said before, you know, the, the, the governors, all 189 governors, agreed to a capital increase and agreed to a program uh, for that capital increase. So the program is there. Um, uh, you know, it, it has to happen. And uh, you, whatever you think before you take the seat of being president of the, of the World Bank Group, once you're in that seat, you understand very quickly that, you know, you've got you've to make peace with 189 member countries. And I think your perspective changes uh, once, once you do take that seat. Question over here, please. I'm Kushagar. I'm an undergrad studying computer science and economics. My question is, in your experience, what change have you witnessed in India over the past decade, say? And where do you see their position in the global economy and geopolitically moving forward in the future? So, I mean, you know, I, I, had, a, I had a very close working relationship with Prime Minister Modi, and we worked on a number of things. For example, uh, he, he is extremely ambitious in terms of uh, converting some of their energy to, to solar, yeah, and we, we worked with him on that. He was very focused on improving the business environment to bring in more uh, 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 you know, private sector uh, finance. Um, so, so, uh, he was extremely focused on sanitation, and so Swachh Bharat was, uh, uh, and, and, I, and I think a, a, huge num a huge percentage of the problem of childhood stunting in India is related to sanitation as opposed to nutrition. I mean, in Indian nutritional status is relatively high compared to some countries that have lower childhood stunting rates. So I think sanitation is really important. I, I mean, you know, I, I was pretty blunt about the, the problem of childhood stunting, you know, 38% childhood stunting. And for those of you who don't know, I mean, childhood stunting is uh, having children who are two standard deviations below height for age. And below height for age is much more important than below weight for age. Weight can, can, uh, can vary. And uh, the studies now show that, boy, you know, childhood stunting has just a huge impact. Uh, I mean, you know, the number of neuronal connections you're making during the time that you're growing is, is huge. And you know, David taught us that, that childhood stunting has a, is probably a huge proportion of the impact of um, health on, on, on economic growth over time. And so I, you know, I told them that this is a major issue for you guys. I mean, if 38% if, if of this generation is unable to compete in the digital economy, what are they going to do? You know, what, and what are you going to do with them? Uh, so I, th I think, you know, in many ways, um, from an economic perspective, I think, uh, you know, Prime Minister Modi changing uh, the, uh, the, the business environment was very important. Uh, you know, things like uh, the goods and services tax, right? It used to be that, um, that Indian trucks had to stop at every border of every state and sometimes took days to pay the taxes. Now you go from one end to the other and you pay at the end. That is revolutionary. I mean, for people who've ever done business in India, knowing that you have to do that was just killing um, uh, commerce. So some of those changes were really, really important. But I think, I think the human capital issue is the major one for, for India. Will there always be low-skilled jobs that the um, uh, adults who are stunted as children will be able to do? I'm not sure. I mean, I, I don't know where automation and, and, and robotics is going. So. Um, uh, I think, you know, the, the focus on sanitation is a good start, but they're going to really have to figure out how to improve health and education outcomes across the board.
here. Um, my name is Dana. I'm a freshman. I just um, studying, excuse me. And I'm studying environmental science. Great. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask. You mentioned the sort of 200 million that was set aside to fight. Um, 200 billion. Billion. Sorry, that was fight, um, set aside to combat anthropogenic climate change. So. Um, I kind of wanted to ask, given that climate change is disproportionately affecting countries who are least prepared, but, you know, more importantly, contribute the least, how do you think we can be cognizant of environmental justice and in investing equitably? Um, and do you think this creates an opportunity to sort of galvanize ENG, ESG investment, which, as you mentioned, is lacking? So, uh, and again, this is one of the primary reasons that I, that I resigned from the World Bank Group, because I just didn't feel that this was happening. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, as a, as a person who studied at Brown and did a PhD in anthropology and who has read um, more, you know, Marx and Lenin than, than probably any of you have or ever will, right? Um, uh, uh, you know, when you are faced with something like climate change, you have to ask yourself, what are the forces in the world that are powerful enough to drive a complete change in the way we think about energy, or a complete change in the way we think about building infrastructure so that it's climate resilient. And I have to say, unfortunately, there's no force that I can see other than market forces. Right? So um, that, you know, getting market forces moving in the right direction so that, for example, investing in solar or in wind instead of coal is such a great business proposition that people are running to try to do it. Now, uh, we're not quite there yet. What we really need is a price on carbon. But I don't think we're going to get a price on carbon until something happens that's so bad that it scares the leaders for long enough to make, to, to make the decision that there will be a global price on carbon. Right? Now, there's a lot of interesting um, uh, hap things happening at the state level. There's, there are things that are happening you know, in like the, the Nordic countries. I mean, Sweden has shown that you can completely uncouple e uh, economic growth from, uh, uh, from carbon emission and still have robust economic growth. But that's Sweden, you know, 9 million people. Uh, and, and, um, uh, and so we have to find ways of aligning market forces so that, that literally out of greed, people are running to try to make the kinds of investments that will protect us from the most devastating uh, impacts of climate change. Now, the great thing, the thing that I'm really proud of with the $200 billion announcement was that half of it's for adaptation, right? So, you know, while there may be, um, uh, a, uh, there may be interest in, th in, in mitigation, because everyone cares about mitigation, Mitig you know, reducing carbon um, is, is something that affects everybody. You know, helping poor countries adapt to climate change is not something that affects everybody. Uh, we're very proud that, we're able, that, that the half of it was for adaptation. It's the largest amount ever committed for climate change adaptation. Uh, but um, uh, that's the great, that, that's the great challenge of our time. Can we align market forces so that we are, you know, that everyone is going crazy, that every student at Brown wants to figure out how to make carbon capture work? Because if they do that, they're going to become billionaires. Or, you know, and it's not quite there. We're, 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 not, we're not there. So uh, I'm waiting for that moment where something so devastating happens that people are looking around saying, oh, my God, this is terrible. What do we need to do? And the first answer is price on carbon. So, I was, I was host of the um, Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition. We started this when I, in my second year, and it still goes on, right? And a lot of good talk, but not much action. And ESG, ESG for everybody is, is, is investing that, that abides by uh, principles of that, that are environmentally sound, socially conscious, and that are focused on good governance, ESG. And there are so many people talking about ESG and impact investing, and so little investing actually happening. Right? And again, um, we're hoping we can, we can change that. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for coming in to speak with us today. Um, my name is Jeremy, and I'm a junior studying history and philosophy. And I'm also a first-generation immigrant from Seoul, so I look up to you in many ways. <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I look up to you for studying history and uh, philosophy. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Professor Steinfeld briefly mentioned this just now. but. As you, of course, already know, President Trump just yesterday nominated David Malpass uh, to be a replacement as the next president of the World Bank. Um, and in the past, um, Undersecretary Malpass has been a vocal critic of the World Bank's expansion. And we don't know for certain whether he will be the next president. Um, but under this new proposed leadership, how do you see the World Bank shifting its prior objectives 
and initiatives. Um, do you think the fiscal footing that you've been able to establish during your term may be vulnerable to this leadership transition? Well, you know, I know David well. And in fact, um, uh, you know, uh, um, David was critical in us getting the capital increase, which he's, you know, I, I think he's been saying that. Um, uh, we would not have gotten the capital increase if, uh, if uh, David had not advocated for it, right? So um, he, there's, you know, he, I, I think that, um, uh, you know, one of the things that happened during the time of his greater engagement with the World Bank Group is that he understood it much better than he did in the past. And, and I have to tell you, the World Bank Group is a very difficult thing to understand uh, if you're not inside it. Right? And, and so I had, when I first started, I brought some of the great um, you know, institutional uh, uh, leaders and thinkers. You know, Alan Mulally from Ford uh, is a friend of mine. He came and looked at the World Bank. Michael Porter, the great business school professor at Harvard, came. And, and every single one of them said, oh, my God, this is the most complicated institution I have ever seen. You guys do public sector, you guys do private sector, you do equity investments, you do debt, you do transport, health, education. How, how, do you, how can anyone keep your, your head around the whole thing? So, um, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know who will be the next uh, president of the World Bank. I mean, uh, what, what they've said, what the board has said is that there will be an open and transparent process and anyone can nominate uh, any candidate. Um, but, I, you know, uh, 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 David was also part of the process of embracing the new direction for the World Bank Group that was part of the conditions of giving us a capital increase. And he was also uh, you know, a part of the group that, um, that endorsed all the, uh, the, the long-term you know, uh, strategy work that we'd already done. So um, I, I, don't know, I don't know what the result of the election will be. I don't, I, you can't, again, as I said earlier, um, there is a huge difference uh, in, in, uh, in, in what you think the World Bank is from the outside. And then when you're sitting in the seat and you're, and you're going to the board meetings and you're seeing, you know, the, all these people there representing 189 member governments, I, I, I think it, um, it gives you a different perspective. So um, uh, one of the things that we really worked on when I was there was that policy and lending has to be evidence-based. This is something that comes from, from me from my medical training. But we said, you know, we cannot be an ideological institution. We will lose all credibility for an ideological institution. We have got to be evidence-based in uh, the recommendations that we make to countries. And, um, uh, and, and so I, I, I think it, it, it should be much more difficult you know, to go backwards and become more ideological. I think uh, the, the commitment to being evidence-based is very strong on the board. Hi, I'm Ryan. I'm a freshman. So uh, if the goal, as, as you mentioned earlier, is to provide everyone in the world with broadband access by 2030, uh, I wanted to ask you, what percentage of that do you think will be a result of national projects versus contributions from the projects like uh, Google and Facebook to do the same thing? And uh, if you could also touch on um, what it really means for everyone in the world to have access to broadband in terms of devices. Does that mean people are going to mostly be accessing uh, through libraries and schools and other public access points, or does that mean providing everyone with a personal computer? Yeah, uh, you know, that's a, that is a great question. And uh, what, what is your major and your name? Uh, my name is Ryan. I'm, right now I'm studying a little bit of everything. So okay. <laughs> so you may, you, may, you may be one of the people who figure that out later, because I don't, I don't really know uh, which, which direction it will go. I, I tell you, I think that... Um, um, uh, th there have been some good and bad experiences with um, private companies providing internet access. And uh, some of the bad experiences were companies that said, we'll give you free access, but only to the websites that we want you to have access to. Um, and, and some of the bad experiences from the public sector side are governments that say, we want to control uh, access to every um, communication outlet. So there are, there, are, there are certain countries, and I, I, I can tell you which ones are later, uh, not publicly, but uh, there are certain countries that believe that they want to control uh, telecommunications because they're worried about what their citizens are saying, right? And so, um, uh, you know, we even sent uh, representatives from other countries who had partially privatized their uh, telecommunications and said, you know, you can actually improve functioning uh, by a lot by bringing in the private sector, and you can still uh, listen in to what your people are saying, right? So, I, the, you know, this is the kind of stuff, and, 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 and the entirely publicly controlled ones 
uh, you go there and you immediately know that these, this is not working, right? And so there, 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 there has to be some mix of public and private that gets it right. Um, but usually completely state-owned telecommunications, the, the experience has not been great. But also private sector that comes in and really wants to direct people to certain websites, you know, that's also, that, that, that also doesn't work. So, you know, um, there, there are countries where it was done really well. You know, uh, the, the, this is a country that has many other problems, but Myanmar, right, was one in which we um, uh, were involved when I was there. And um, uh, there were three different um, uh, operators. We had an open, transparent um, an, uh, auction process. And now there's very, very good um, broadband access, access in a place that had nothing, you know, four or five years ago. So it's possible to do it right. It's, it's, a, it's a mixture of public and private, um, um, and that may evolve over time. But uh, we have enough bad experiences to know, I think, how not to do it. Yeah, hi, my name is Henry Dawson. I'm a first year studying biology. Um, I'm really interested in the term you used or the process of preparing human capital for the future. What role do you think Brown and other higher education institutes have in this process, both in the States and globally? Yeah, you know, um, um, in, in fact, I'm coming back. We're doing a, a session on uh, the role of higher education in the world. Right? I am, I am going to plug that plug at that. the end of it. <laughs> You'll get another reminder in a few moments. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I, I, you know, Brown is, um, is you know, one of, the, one of the great institutions of higher education in the world. Right? And so just being one of the great higher institution, inst institutions in the world, higher education institutions in the world, is in and of itself important. Right? Uh, but one of the things we're going to do, and, and, um, and President Paxson is, uh, is, is going to be really leading this charge, is to think about um, uh, how, how can institutions like Brown um, really push forward higher quality higher education everywhere in the world? And uh, what can institutions like Brown do to um, uh, provide a broader benefit for what exists here to many, many more people in the world. Right? Now, you know, um, the online education uh, in, has gone in fits and starts. Um, but, you know, when I, when I talk to people like Saul Khan at Khan Academy or, um, uh, you know, the people who are really in the middle of, uh, of uh, sort of uh, using technology in higher education, uh, they say that eventually, for example, they think maybe two people will teach everyone in the world calculus. Calculus is not easy to teach. And, and apparently there are people uh, who are really good at teaching calculus. I never had those teachers, I have to tell you. <laughs> I was going to say, but, I wish but, I met yeah. them earlier. But apparently, and, and so probably what will happen is you'll get those teachers and, the, and they'll be translated. Now, I was, I think Sal Khan is one of the great teachers I've ever seen. So how many of you use Khan Academy? Yeah, lots of people, right? I use Khan Academy. <clears throat> you know, I, I, um, I, I've used Khan Academy a lot. And so I, when I was in, um, in UAE, uh, I, I met um, uh, um, uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid, the, the head of Dubai. And I told him, you know, it'd be really great if you could just translate all of Sal Khan's materials into Arabic. Because he's got a whole pre-K to 12 curriculum. And I said, you know, you could improve the quality of education quickly if you made Sal Khan's materials available to everybody in, in, in Arabic. And I didn't realize it, but um, about a year and a half later, his team came back and told me, said, okay, we did it. So you did what? We translated everything, right? It took like 8,000 people, right? <laughs> they, he, they felt like they were uh, going against this crazy deadline, but they translated it all into Arabic. And now it's being used um, in, and, and if you, you know, it's all such simple stuff, writing on a piece of paper with a voiceover, you can translate it and it can be pretty effective, right? And so um, they did that, right? So I, uh, I, I, I've been out of higher education long enough that I don't want to make any presumptions and, 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 uh, and uh, you know, in, in preparing for this conference that's coming up, I'm looking at a lot of things, but I think that that technology in education could have an absolutely transformative impact, right? Um, you know, one of the huge things that, that we at the bank, when I was at the bank, unveiled was how poor the quality of teaching was in African countries, right? So we did a survey of uh, elementary school teachers uh, uh, in four or five countries, and only a third of the elementary school teachers could pass the second grade 
uh, competency exam. Only a third, right? So if those are the teachers, what are the kids learning? Okay? Uh, but in another experiment with the private sector, uh, we actually looked at the impact, and it's, it's still an ongoing study, looked at the impact of a private sector group that charged very low rates, something like six to eight dollars per person uh, per student uh, uh, per month. And um, what they did was the teachers were in the room, but all the kids were learning from Sal Khan. Right? And the preliminary results seem to suggest that their outcomes are two standard deviations better than in the regular public schools. Right? And what also happens is that because the teachers are also there, the teachers actually also learn from Sal Khan, right? And the quality of the teaching gets better over time. Right? So, um, you know, what can Brown do? Uh, you know, this just, I remember great teachers at Brown who just explain things. I, you know, I know, I know uh, Professor Hazeltine is still around, right? I took Engine 9, man, from Barrett Hazeltine. <laughs> <laughs> and I had never heard anyone explain electricity as clearly as, uh, as, uh, as Professor Hazeltine. I, I don't, I couldn't do it for you now. I mean, I've forgotten it since then. But I think some of the great teachers and some of the great, um, uh, 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 you know, lessons that are being taught here could be shared with the world. Now on this right. topic, Jim is going to be doing the keynote address in April for the conference. It's a Brown IE joint conference on reinventing higher education, building the human capital of tomorrow. I certainly will be there. Uh, you know, we're running a little short on time and there's going to be a reception afterward, but why don't we take the two questions that are remaining and then Jim, you can answer and we'll move on to the reception. Please. Thank you. Um, my name is Emily Pluhar. I am a sophomore student from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I'm studying political science on the international and comparative track. Um, my question is, in your talk today, you have repeatedly mentioned two key problems facing the international community today, climate change and development. These goals are often seen as being in conflict with one another, with developing countries saying that they need access to the same methods and opportunities that countries that developed years ago used, um, which can often be harmful to the environment, um, and large countries saying that everyone needs to contribute to the climate mission regardless of development status, um, which can push developmental goals to the back burner. Moving forward, how can we work to promote both of these goals at the same time? Great question. Mm -hmm. Hello, thank you for being here. Um, my name is Kimberly, and I'm actually a master's student in the public school of public health. My question is specifically, I don't know if we talked about this because I came in 10 minutes late, but about the Africa continental free trade area. And my question has to do about people skept being skeptical about this agreement and specifically how it will affect SMEs, small and medium enterprises, because countries are a crossroad where you need SMEs to grow your economy, but then you also need to be part of this agreement. And you have a country like Nigeria, like my country, we haven't signed it yet. So, what do you think this will mean going forward? And is the agreement even like a solution at all? Thank you. Okay. So the, 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 the first one, Emily, you know, um, uh, what African leaders will say is um, we are bearing the brunt of the impact of climate change. Um, you know, droughts and floods and droughts and floods and uh, wiping out of roads uh, when we have very little responsibility we're putting the carbon up in the air. I mean, the amount of the current carbon in the air that was put there by Africa is just tiny. Right? And, and so, um, uh, you know, what, what um, uh, leaders have been saying before is, therefore, we should be able to burn as much coal as we want. The good news is that now um, uh, solar energy is cheaper in many places than coal. The problem is storage, right? So if I could just say, you know, uh, you guys, I, I make references, don't even knows what, you know, um, uh, what was, uh, um, oh, gosh, Plastics, um, uh, Mrs. Robinson, what was that movie? Graduate, right? There was a movie called The Graduate, right? And uh, one great line from it was uh, Dustin Hoffman was sitting there as a young man, and, and the guy says to him, you know, the, 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 the key to the future is plastics, right? So I'd say the key to the future is energy storage. If you guys, if anyone can figure out the energy storage issue, <clears throat> because that's the problem with solar. No matter how cheap it is, if you can't store it, and you can't store it in large quantity and move it and use it for base load, industrial base load, then it, you know, there's always going to be a need for fossil fuel of some sort. Um, you know, uh, uh, t changing over coal to natural gas is a, is, a, is a big advantage. And natural gas will be 
a transition fuel. There's no question about it. And so you know, investing more in, in, say, natural gas capacity in Africa and other places is actually a huge improvement over coal. But um, uh, uh, again, I think the key to all this is to get the market forces moving in the right direction. The key, again, is having a flat net carbon. Right? And so um, if without that, it's going to be hard to solve these issues. But I, I'm very sympathetic to the argument that you cannot tell poor countries that they have, they're going to have no energy because climate change is a problem. Right? And so um, I, I, think you can, I think it's very reasonable to say, but that energy should be in the form of renewables and natural gas right? for now. Um, uh, if, the, if the battery storage problem or the transmission problem can be solved, uh, then I think the move in the direction of renewables with, with very low uh, carbon footprint will happen extremely quickly. But that's the issue. That's why, um, um, when was it? Uh, about six months ago, I think, um, we made it uh, at the bank a commitment to provide $1 billion uh, for battery storage. Right? And so we, we were hoping that that $1 billion, that would, that would uh, get people interested in developing new technology. But it's a, it's a, it's a fundamental tension. And I, for me, the answer has always been, it's not one or the other. You know, we've got to get going on both extremes. But you know, when I started at the bank in 2012, uh, you know, the, the climate change folks came and said, we're so excited. We've got now solar uh, down to 15 cents a kilowatt hour. I think that's what it was, 13, 15 cents. And I said, well, what, what is that? I didn't know what it meant. They said, well, coal's about 4 cents a kilowatt hour. And the Washington, in Washington, D.C., we pay about 10 to 12 cents a kilowatt hour. So it's getting close. The latest, the, the latest auction that I saw was you know, months ago, and it was 1.5 cents a kilowatt hour for solar without storage, right? So it's getting so, so low uh, that if we can solve the storage problem, I think the move toward renewables is going to be huge. Now, the company I'm joining is one of the biggest players in renewable energy in the world. Right? So we hope we can make that work. Uh, the Africa Free Trade Agreement, you know, I, I actually don't know all the details of the Africa Free Trade Agreement, but here's, here's what I'll say. So um, we found often that it's much easier for a country in Africa to sell goods in Europe than it is to sell to the neighboring country. So there's a desperate need to figure out trade regimes in Africa. Now, uh, you know, because I, I just don't know the details of this particular free trade agreement, I can't. Uh, I, I, don't, I can't comment on it very much, uh, but, uh, you know, if you want to tackle poverty, you have to have more trade, not less, right? So, and I, I know there, there, there are many people who say, oh, trade is terrible. It, it's, it's, it's actually absolutely critical, uh, because if you don't have trade, you're not going to be able to, you know, give poor people access to markets in other countries, you, you, and, and it just... In, in Africa, we've got to figure it out. Let me tell you another problem now. So Africa um, uh, desperately needs to be able to sell its goods and send them all over the world. But there is no air uh, space agreement for large parts of Africa. So they have to take these crazy routes in Africa to avoid the airspace of specific countries. We have to solve that problem as well. You know, um, there's no rail service that goes from one end of Africa to another. President Sisi of Egypt is now talking about, as he takes over the presidency of the African Union, he wants to create a rail line from, that goes from Cairo to, 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 uh, to Cape Town. Um, there's so many things that are needed to make um, uh, the possibility of economic growth more viable in the continent that you know, a better trade agreements are important. Uh, the, role and the, the, the role of Nigeria in a particular one, I just, I just don't know, I have enough detail. We've reached the end of this portion of the evening, but we're going to have a reception outside that you're all invited to attend. I, I really want to close just by saying two things. First, Jim, I, I want to thank you for <clears throat> enriching us and, and uh, being a member of this community and moving forward being a, a member. I, I feel so privileged to be able to sit here and, and listen to you. The second thing is really a thank you to you all. The questions are fantastic, whether you're a freshman or, or a faculty member. Again, I feel uh, deeply privileged to be part of this conversation, to be listening to this conversation and learning from it. So there's lots to celebrate, and let's take that celebration outside. But first, this is my first event as a, as a fellow of the Watson Institute. With more to come. More to come. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks everybody. Everybody. Thank you, Jim. <laughs>